COVID has, has uh, made so many rules for us of things that we can't do. But one thing we can do, and many of us are doing more than ever, is walking. And um, it's time to learn some new pathways. Um, so to advise us, we have Robert Lorzo. Uh, Robert, he is a um, freelance journalist and photographer in Chicago. His historical nonfiction book, Alchemy of Bones, Chicago's Lutgert Murder Case in, of 1897, was published in 2003 by University of Illinois Press. His reporting and writing has appeared in many publications, including the Tribune, the Reader, Chicago Magazine, Crane's Chicago Business, Playbill, the Sun-Times, New City, Midwest Living, Make It Better Magazine, Chicago Lawyer, the Daily South Town, Illinois Issues, Belt Magazine, and Huffington Post, as well as the now defunct Punk Planet, Wondering Sound, Signal to Noise, and North Shore Magazine. <laughs> That's a very long list, impressive. He also reported on air for WBEZ Chicago Public Radio, including stories for Curious City and the late great 848 morning show. His Twitter account, at Robert Lorzel, has more than 10,000 followers. In 2016, he won the Chicago Reader's Poll for best Chicagoan to follow on Twitter. Lorzel has also worked as a co contributing copy editor for Chicago Magazine and as a freelance copy editor for, Chicago, for the Chicago Tribune. His concert photography and reviews appear on his blog, which is called undergroundb.com, and his photos have been published in Rolling Stone, The Reader, and other media. He is writing another book, or two, or three, but tonight's, <laughs> tonight's program is informed by his latest book, <laughs> the second edition of Walking Chicago, 35 Tours of the Windy City's Dynamic Neighborhoods and a Famous Lakeshore. It was published last year by Boulderness Press. Robert, thank you so much for being here tonight, and I'll let you take it from here. Well, thank you for inviting me, Grace. Um, you mentioned uh, my Twitter account. It's actually up. I have, uh, I'll, I'll have to check to see how many uh, followers I have right at the moment, but it's up around 16, 17,000, I think. And one of the many things I like to do is when I'm walking around the city, I will tweet uh, pictures of uh, things that I notice. Uh, it could be something as mundane uh, as a manhole cover that's got an interest, interesting design, or perhaps a building um, that I've never noticed before that has uh, interesting architecture. Um, I'm a fan of nature, so I look for uh, birds and uh, other animals out there. Um, and when I get a nice picture of them, I might tweet that. So uh, some people <clears throat> who follow me on Twitter have the impression that I'm constantly walking around the city. Uh, <laughs> that's not true. And there are plenty of other people who walk just as much as I do. But uh, walking is one of the things I like best about living in Chicago. It's how I get around every day, whether I'm heading to work, uh, going out for coffee in the pre-pandemic times, um, or just exploring. Um, Several years ago, I decided that I should uh, walk for at least an hour every day. Um, partly that was for health reasons, um, trying to uh, stay healthy. Um, also, it's just uh, something to look forward to every day, a little break from being inside, a uh, chance to either think as I'm walking around or explore and have sort of a miniature adventure. Um, so my book, which came out last year, as, as you can see from the title, it has 35 tours of the city. Um, there, it's just a selection of different walks you can take in the city of Chicago. Um, not complete by any uh, <laughs> guide by any means. Uh, there are so many places that I would have loved to include it in the book that it, it just it just wasn't space for it. So, but one thing that happens, my book came out uh, last year uh, as the pandemic was going on. Some people said, you know, the timing of the book is great because people want to get out and walk. Um, to some extent, that's true. But, you know, my book also includes uh, information about things like restaurants and businesses and museums. And a lot of those things have been closed uh, in the past year. Some places have, have gone out of business altogether, uh, you know, as I'm sure all of you know, we are sort of at a, I feel like we're at a turning point where as we hopefully come out of this pandemic, uh, some things will change in our city and the rest of the country. It remains to be seen things like, you know, how will movie theaters do as they try to come back from this time period? So I kind of feel like my book came out at a weird moment in time. Um, I hope it's useful information, but, uh, 
some of it's going to be out of date uh, <laughs> as, as things change. Um, one of the things about uh, being in the city here oops, is and, and walking it is a question of walking during the pandemic. Um, and the, if you recall in the early days of stay at home, a lot of people were leery about uh, even going outside, but as health experts have, have come to believe that uh, COVID-19 spreads much more easily indoors rather than outdoors. So being outdoors is, is a good thing during the pandemic. Um, here's, I, I pulled some information from the CDC website, which is fairly up to date. This is from uh, January, where they're encouraging people to spend time outdoors, but they still, encourage you to uh, wear a mask and to uh, stay six feet away from people. This still raises the question, which is, when I'm out walking, I wonder as I'm passing someone on a sidewalk or if I'm walking down a city sidewalk and I see someone coming in my direction, and especially if it's someone who's not wearing a mask, I'm always wearing a mask. I feel a little leery. Uh, how close should I get to this person? What are the odds that uh, if we just pass for a second on the sidewalk, is it really that much of a danger? Um, here's a story that the BBC did recently and where they talked to some health experts. And I thought that this was a pretty good summary of, of what you should be aware of in that situation. Walking past someone in the street or having a jogger run by you means you're closer together for a few seconds at most. Fleeting encounters are unlikely to be long enough for the virus to reach you. Professor Kathy Noakes, or Kath Noakes says someone would have to cough right at you at the moment you're inhaling, but for, for an infection to happen. But she also warns of friends spending a long time together outdoors and assuming they're completely safe. Going for a run with someone and following close behind them for 20 minutes or more, breathing in their slipstream might be a problem, she said. So uh, my advice here is to be cautious, uh, but to get out there if you can. And whether you're coming into Chicago, the city that I'm uh, talking about, or if you're just doing it in Glencoe or somewhere else, uh, <clears throat> I think it's good to get out, but you know, be cautious. Now, Chicago itself is a great place to go walking. Um, I looked at this uh, website called walkscore.com where they rated different cities uh, based on uh, how walkable they are. And they rank Chicago as the sixth best uh, large city in the US. And this is based on, you know, they analyze hundreds of walking routes to nearby amenities. Essentially, if you're in the city, how easily can you, can you get to uh, some of the uh, kinds of essential businesses and places that you would want to get to by just going on foot? And uh, the, the easier it is to get to those places, the higher your score is. You might be wondering if Chicago is number six, what are the uh, other cities, the top five? How's Glencoe rate? Uh, I looked that up and <clears throat> they give Glencoe pretty, um, pretty good, uh, rating of 71, just a little bit below uh, Chicago. Um, I know Glencoe because uh, I often go up there to see uh, plays at Writers Theater and I do uh, like walking around that downtown area there. Um, there was at least one time when I decided uh, I'm gonna take the train, the Metro train up from Chicago to Glencoe, but I'm gonna get off a stop or two early. I can't remember which stop I got off, but I basically walked from you know Winnetka up to Glencoe in the late afternoon before uh, seeing a play and that was very pleasant. Um, when, but if you compare it to some other suburbs, <clears throat> suburbs that have a lots of um, cul-de-sacs and windy roads that are designed for cars are really uh, not as friendly to getting around on foot. So um, I'm going to be speaking, doing a similar program for the Lake Zurich Library next month, and they ranked uh, Lake Zurich at 32 and said it's a car-dependent city. I used to live in uh, Palatine, and it also gets not such a great rating of 39. Um, although the part of Palatine I lived in was the downtown, and you know it was not too bad for walking. My book has uh, 35 walks around the city, and you can see here. I'm going to talk about a couple of the walks just to give you a sample of what the book is like. Um, it covers all sides of the city, starting downtown. The loop has so much in it that we wanted that I wanted to include that it's divided up into several parts. Uh, you know, three parts on the loop, 
uh, separate walk through Millennium Park, separate walk through Grant Park, and so on. And as you go down to uh, the south side, uh, I included a walk through Bronzeville, walks through Hyde Park and Kenwood, Jackson Park and Sh South Shore. Uh, Wolf Lake is a fascinating place down by the Indiana border, gives some uh, nature down there. Um, included places on the west side, like the like Little Italy, um, down Bridgeport and Tilson. And as you come up to the north side, um, I included areas such as Rogers Park and Andersonville. And uh, one of the ones that I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna concentrate on two areas, uh, River North and uh, Graceland Cemetery. Uh, River North, where is River North? Um, so anytime we talk about one of these neighborhoods, uh, there's some question of what exactly we're talking about. So this is an old uh, city map where they officially designated where River North was. Um, it's north of the main branch of the Chicago River uh, and the North Branch and uh, everything south of Chicago Avenue and west of Clark Street. But the map has kind of changed and there's a more recent one you can see on Google where now they say uh, it extends all the way over to Michigan Avenue. And it's really, if you look at a bigger map here, there's this place called the Near North Side, which is a wider area. River North is sort of a subset of that. So my walk goes through parts of River North. You might say I'm cheating by going up a, up into uh, the Near North Side, uh, heading over towards uh, Michigan Avenue, but uh, basically tried to get uh, some of the more interesting spots in the neighborhood into one walk that's, uh, this one's about three miles long. And, you know, my book is was really designed for people who you can either drive your car to the beginning of the walk or you can go by a CTA. Um, some cases you can take a metro train. These days, I mean, I used to ride the CTA a lot. I have not been riding it during the pandemic. Um, I basically want to minimize my exposure to people and... Uh, I know people are riding the CTA and it's probably safe if you keep your distance and wear a mask from uh, everyone, but um, uh, driving a car might be another option. Um, for, with a route like this, uh, you can see that my routes kind of zigzag through the neighborhood and um, you don't finish where you begin. So when you get to the end of the walk, you're probably gonna have to walk a little further or maybe hop on a bus to get back to the beginning if you've parked your car over there. So. Part one, uh, uh, point one on, on the map is uh, the River North Art District. Um, and this is an area where um, you have a real concentration of galleries um, right around uh, the Chicago Avenue stop on the Purple Line and the Brown Line is a good place to get off. And if you walk along Superior Street, you'll see a lot of these galleries. Uh, many of them are still open uh, during the pandemic. If you look at the uh, look at their websites, and a good place to go for information is the uh, ChicagoGalleryNews.com website. Uh, Chicago Gallery News is a little publication uh, that focuses strictly on the exhibits, and they offer uh, tours uh, every couple of. Uh, I think it's every Saturday. Although I, uh, you'd have to check their website to make sure that the tours are going on. Um, during uh, the pandemic. Um, the other thing is that every other month, uh, on the first Friday of the month, um, the galleries in River North all have their openings. So it's a real fun night where you can uh, go around to a bunch of galleries uh, in one night. If, as you continue walking uh, west on Superior, you'll see this building, uh, which is the Brehan Pub, an Irish pub. Um, but it's more famous for something that it was for a brief time in the late 70s. In 1978, this was the Mirage Tavern that uh, where Sun, the Sun Times uh, investigative team um, created their own uh, bar and uh, to see what kind of payoffs they would have to give to city inspectors uh, to keep the place running. And so that was a big famous investigation uh, very controversial too, because some people thought that the sometimes went too far in terms of uh, posing as uh, bar owners and employees. But I always think of that when I walk past there. 
as you can, this is one of my favorite little spots, uh, this little house, uh, which is uh, surrounded by um, uh, modern high rises. It's a it's at 154 West Superior. It's a two story Italianate row house built in 1888, which has somehow survived um, all the changes going on in the neighborhood. Um, and it was converted into offices uh, just a couple of years ago. So I'm hoping it stays there. I, I like old architecture. I don't mind a lot of modern architecture, but I hate to see old buildings torn down. Um, so as you go uh, east on Superior and then turn north on Dearborn, you'll get to the corner uh, where the um, old Bush Temple of Music stands. It's a really grand building. It was not actually a temple. Um, it was a uh, J.E.O. -E Pridmore designed it, and it was the uh, Bush and Gertz Piano Company's headquarters uh, when it opened in 1901. Um, and it was just being converted into uh, apart luxury apartments a couple of years ago. Uh, this is the photo I took of it when I was walking past. And now it's just called the Bush Temple. Here's a couple of pictures from <clears throat> the website for that. And as you continue north, uh, on Dearborn, you will get to Washington Square Park, which is a lovely uh, square block. Um, I like these parks that are not really recreational, but are uh, places where you can sit around and relax and enjoy the, uh, the scenery. Um, this is uh, the same scene in winter, and you can see that building across uh, on the north side of the park is the great uh, Newberry Library. This park used to be known as uh, Bug House Square. Uh, some people still call that. Uh, <clears throat> it was basically famous as a place where in the early um, 20th century, it was known as a haven of free speech. And when this neighborhood sort of had its ups and downs, it went from a very uh, luxury neighborhood to one where uh, Bohemians were living. And so in this period in the 20s and 30s, uh, you would have uh, radicals uh, get up on their soapboxes in Bugga Square and give speeches and people would uh, listen in and sometimes maybe uh, boo them or cheer them depending on what they thought. Um, the Newberry Library uh, is a great uh, institution. I'm not sure how, all, how familiar all of you are with it. It's a privately run library and you can't check out books, but um, they have lots of interesting exhibits. I love to go in and do historical research. Um, here's a, just an example of something I looked at when I went into the library one time. Um, uh, they have all kinds of old books and manuscripts. This is an, a map, uh, the actual physical map that was drawn by a surveyor in 1819 of uh, the, it's called the official survey of the boundaries of the Indian lands ceded to the United States by the Treaty of St. Louis. So this is one of the first maps anyone ever drew of Chicago and the surrounding area. And here's a close-up of, uh, of where they show the place that is now Chicago. And uh, I basically held my iPhone over the map and took this little picture, which they let you do. Um, they let you touch all this stuff, although this is you know in, in protective plastic. So um, I just love going in there and looking at things. Um, and while I was up there uh, looking down at the at Washington Square Park this uh, on a wintry day, this was what the uh, scene looked like uh, looking out the window of New the Newberry Library. Um, and as you can see here from the Newberry's website, they are reopening uh, March 2nd next week. Um, but again, as with all the places on this walk, if you go, you've got to uh, make sure you're uh, wearing a mask and following their um, protocol. Um, over at the northeast corner of that square uh, over on uh, Dearborn um, is Unity Church, which is it'll, it's a less famous uh, church than some of the ones in the neighborhood, um, but it, it's, an, it's an old one. I mean, it opened as Unity Church in 1867. Uh, the, the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 destroyed its wooden portions, but the Gothic uh, style Joliet limestone wall survived. And then it was rebuilt in 1873. And it's, um, it was known for a long time as the Scottish Rite Cathedral. Um, these days, more recently, it's uh, the Harvest Bible Chapel's Chicago Cathedral. And over on, 
on the right side of the picture here, you know, coming for a close-up, you can see this arch with the sort of unusual name, Oriental Consistory. Um, does, does that have anything to do with Oriental uh, as a word for Asians, as far as I can tell? It, it, this was the name of a um, secret uh, Masonic group uh, that met there. Uh, it was also known as the Sublime Princes of the Royal Secret. And they were part of the ancient accepted Scottish Rite in the Valley of Chicago. <laughs> that was the name. Now, as you continue south um, on the street there, um, you can turn, there's a nice row of houses. And as you turn into the alley, there's this really, the, the alley has a name, it's called Tooker Place. And as you go in there now, I mean, it's really not much to look at. Uh, there's really no reason why you would think this is a tourist attraction or anything like that. But this alley has an interesting history. Um, it's just south of uh, 863 North Dearborn. And this was the place where the Dill Pickle Club was uh, back in those Bohemian days. Uh, this was um, a place where you can see on the, 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 this historic photo, the door said, step high, stoop low, leave your dignity outside. <laughs> and so they had all kinds of interesting uh, programs here, masquerade balls, radical lectures. They had candid talks about taboo topics like homosexuality. Um, and this is all around uh, 1914, 1918 in that era. Um, and people like uh, Clarence Darrow were known to uh, hang out here, Ben Hecht, uh, Edgar Lee Masters. Um, supposedly uh, Mae West even stopped in here when she was in Chicago. Um, so exit the, if you exit the alley and then continue south on Dearborn, um, there's an interesting spot here where you can see a couple of these uh, carved uh, heads uh, on this brick wall along Dearborn. Um, and unfortunately, uh, this one here has had a damage to its nose, uh, I think a couple of years ago. Uh, I hate to see uh, things like that happen. These busts were part of the uh, Garrick Schiller Theater in downtown Chicago, which was designed by Louis Sullivan and Dankmar Adler, one of the uh, great uh, architectural palaces that unfortunately uh, was demolished in the 1960s to make way for a parking garage, which outraged people like uh, Richard Nickel, the um, photographer and architectural preservationist. This is a photo from one of the um, protests against that. And, you know, ironically, the um, parking garage that was built there was, has since been torn down. So, you know, it just seems uh, ridiculous that this building, this architectural treasure was lost. Um, but we have those couple of pieces of it sitting there. And uh, there are a few of those other heads of, of I think they're basically of all famous uh, German and dramatic um, writers. Um, if you look at the second city uh, facade in uh, another part of the city, those, those are also from uh, the Garrick or Schiller Theater. So back to our route here as you're continuing south on Dearborn. You'll see some uh, Italianate row houses that were built back in the 1870s around the time of the Great Chicago Fire um, that have survived. Um, there's this towering uh, building, Lawson House, which was a YMCA. Um, it's now apartments uh, leaning towards affordable housing, I believe. And um, there's a plaque, the benefactor who's uh, who is named afterwards Victor Fremont Lawson, who uh, you may know as uh, some of you, if you remember, <laughs> he was a publisher of the Chicago Daily News in addition to being involved in the YMCA. Um, as you look south there uh, across the street, and this picture is a bit out of date. This is from a couple of years ago. Um, you can see Holy Name Cathedral across that square there. Um, this corner is where, um, Back in the 1960s, uh, you had a folk music club here, whose name I am blanking on. <laughs> uh, hold on a second here. Let me check my notes. Oh, yes, the Gate of Horn was right at the spot uh, we're looking at um, behind where the newspaper box is. And um, that is where people like Bill 
Big Bill Brunzi, Odetta, Roger McGuinn, Judy Collins, Joan Baez, Peter Palmieri performed uh, from 1956 to 1961 in the basement of the Rice Hotel. Um, but this block has construction going on in it uh, now. And so uh, here's a picture from a little bit later. And uh, if you went there today, you would see even higher construction going up. And this is what it's supposed to look like when it's done in a couple of years uh, or a year or so. Um, it's called One Chicago Square. It's two glass skyscrapers. One of them is uh, almost a thousand feet tall. So this is, you know, like another skyscraper up in the realm of the buildings like the, the Willis Tower and Hancock. Um, and you can see in this picture, if you kind of squint at it down way below all that, there's Holy Name Cathedral. <laughs> it looks tiny compared to the skyscraper. I'm wondering what that's going to be like. Um, down a uh, block south of here is the Poetry Foundation, which uh, is not only a great place to visit for uh, seeing poetry readings and visiting the library, but um, this is some modern architecture that I find actually interesting. Um, and kind of beautiful, but it's by architect John Rohan, Ronan, and it was built in 2011. And uh, as you walk along that kind of uh, metal grid there, you can look inside and there's sort of an in interior uh, courtyard with trees growing in it uh, inside the wall. Here's Holy Name Cathedral over on the corner there, um, which is, you know, the seat of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese uh, opened in 18. 75, four years after the Great Chicago Fire. Um, Pope John Paul II visited here in, in 1979, of course, when he was in town. The one-ton brass doors at the top of the main steps are covered with these intricate patterns of the Tree of Life, which is beautiful to look at. As you go uh, another block east and then turn south on, uh, let's see, what street are we on? Wabash. Um, here's another historic church, uh, St. James, which uh, is where uh, Ada Abraham Lincoln worshiped uh, right after he was elected president in 1860. Um, the building um, it has a remnant of uh, the Great Chicago Fire in it, if you stop inside. And I also know it as a great place for uh, hosting classical music concerts that are free and open to the public in the summer. Um, that building just to the south of it, uh, it's the Richard Driehaus Museum, which is a uh, mansion from the uh, Gilded Age uh, from the 1800s. Uh, that was originally the uh, home of um, Nickerson. And um, it's now a, a nice museum that has a lot. It, it, partly, uh, it's just kind of an uh, interesting place to go inside and see what uh, people of the upper class lived like in uh, the late 1800s to see the furnishings and uh, the architecture. But they also have interesting exhibits on um, of art and uh, decor from that era. This is another place that has been closed during the pandemic. And I uh, just checked today on their website and they're opening uh, Saturday, March 6th. Um, Kitty Corner from there is the Ransom Art Cable House, which is not open to the public, but um, it's just, you know, simply beautiful to look at it as you walk past. And um, there's a courtyard behind it with lots of sculpture in it. Uh, on this particular day when I was there, I'm not sure why they had that uh, <laughs> antique car in it, but uh, parked there, but uh, it made for a nice uh, little uh, thing to look at. Um, so continuing south on Wabash, we get to Medina Temple, which um, as you know, in more recent years, uh, it was the uh, Bloomingdale's home store. Uh, there were plans announced uh, for it to be um, uh, renovated, uh, but it's still not clear exactly what is going to happen with it. It's really a beautiful structure that was originally, um, you know, part of the, the Medina organization of Shriners, um, which has uh, Arabic writing on it, which is kind of interesting. Um, it was part of the fascination at that in the era with uh, Middle Eastern uh, design and architecture. Um, and 
the CSO uh, often performed inside the theater inside. This is a photo from CSO's website from uh, 1976 of the orchestra recording music in there. Uh, this tended to be uh, not necessarily the main venue for um, concerts, but where they would uh, record albums because of the uh, great acoustics in there. I happen to see one performance inside uh, Medina Temple before it became the Bloomingdale's and I would love to see the theater um, open again. Um, so bear with me a second here. I wanna find something in my notes before I continue talking. So as we continue so, uh, on the same area there, right by the Medina Temple, you'll see, uh, well, there's the two pizzeria restaurants, Pizzeria Uno and Pizzeria Due, du I'm sorry, <laughs> my Italian's terrible. Um, I thought I was a long time curious about this building because it you know, looks like an old house and it actually is. It's a handsomely painted uh, second empire style house, which the lumber merchant Nathan Mears bought, uh, built right after the 1871 fire destroyed his previous house, which had been at that location. Um, as we, we also see here, uh, Tree Studios, which is a nice complex with lots of uh, great architectural details. And uh, Tao Restaurant, which um, you will probably remember this as uh, the Excalibur nightclub perhaps. Uh, it was originally the Chicago Historical Society before they uh, went moved to their current location. Uh, here's a picture of what it looked like in the Excalibur days and a picture from uh, inside the Excalibur um, it was a nightclub of uh, a few different names. Um, it's supposedly haunted, but you know, I'm skeptical about all stories about the uh, haunting. So um, I was not able to find really very much a uh, solid information that confirms anyone has ever seen a ghost inside the place. Uh, this is what it looks like now inside the Tao restaurant, a picture from the Tao restaurant website. Um, as you continue walking through this part of uh, River North, there's all these restaurants. Uh, we used to have the hard, the uh, rock and roll uh, McDonald's, but that was torn down and it was replaced with this uh, really strikingly contemporary McDonald's at the Southwest corner of Clark and Ontario, which is, um, has rooftop solar panels. Uh, there's a, a garden growing inside. So it's sort of the most, the green uh, energy efficient McDonald's you'll ever find. Um, the Ohio House Restaurant is a great, Ohio House Hotel is a great example of mid 20th century architecture that I always lo love to look at uh, when I'm in this area. And uh, if you're following my route, I'm sorry if it's a little confusing where we're going here, but uh, I get to Courthouse Place, which uh, used to be the uh, Chicago Criminal Courts building um, from 1893 to 1929. Um, my book, uh, which Grace mentioned, um, my book, Alchemy of Bones, the other book, um, is about a murder trial that happened here in this courthouse. Uh, Adolf Lutgert uh, charged with killing his wife whose body disappeared. Um, and here's one of the uh, Chicago Daily News illustrations where you can see the building from back in 1897. And some, uh, Chicago Daily News photos from the early 1900s uh, showing the building in the background as a judge is walking in front of it. If you walk around to the east side of the courthouse and go up to the alley, um, in this picture here on the building on the right side is a fire station, but that's where the, uh, the Cook County Jail used to be back in um, this era of the early 1900s. And it's also where they, um, they used to commit, uh, they used to do executions here uh, when the county handled them. So uh, they had hangings inside this building, including the famous hangings of the uh, four anarchists convicted in the Haymarket case in 1887 happened here. These are some photos of what this area looked like when the uh, Cook County Jail was there. Finally, towards the end of the walk here, we get down towards uh, the part of River North where you might recognize Harry Carey's restaurant. Um, the architecture of this building is interesting. It's, it's supposedly the only building in Chicago that's an example of Dutch Renaissance architecture. 
uh, built in 1895 for the Chicago Varnish Company um, by, uh, designed by Henry Ives Cobbs. Um, this building is also notable because uh, one of Chicago's famous gangsters, Henry uh, uh, Frank Nitty, um, lived in an apartment here. And behind that, you can see the towers of Marina City. Um, the last part of my walk uh, takes us through that part of, of um, River North where you're down by the river, I'm going past some of the uh, restaurants and things like the Museum of uh, Broadcast Communications. But I wanna jump ahead here to my next walk, um, Grayson Cemetery. Uh, and this is one where it's just a short uh, blurb in my book rather than a full chapter but I wanna kind of give you a bonus uh, look at the cemetery. It's uh, the entrances, uh, this is in the Lakeview neighborhood or next to Uptown where I live. So I go there pretty frequently, maybe once a week or so during the pandemic. The entrance is at Irving Park Road and uh, Clark Street and you can just drive in there and park and walk around. It's one of the safest places you can go in the city because uh, really aren't a lot of people other than um, people uh, jogging um, or walking around or visiting their loved ones. Um, here's the hours. It's generally open eight to four most days, uh, nine to four on Saturday and Sunday. And uh, here's a map, which you can get uh, this from the graceandcemetery.org website uh, with a suggested route. Um, I don't really say that you should follow an exact route as you go through here. I kind of take a big loop following, following uh, some of the numbers here but it's good to wander around and discover things. The website has a burial search function where if you're looking for someone in particular, like here I looked at Dexter Graves and it'll tell you where the web, where the um, grave is. Uh, with some of them, but not all the graves, it'll give you directions and you click on that and uh, it pops up. If you've got your phone with you as you're walking around the cemetery, it can direct you on Google Maps right to the spot, which is kind of nice. I also recommend using the findagrave.com website uh, for any cemetery. Uh, it's not complete and it's not 100% reliable. It's a bit like Wikipedia where people put their own information in, but it, I find it to be pretty useful. Um, if you're looking for where someone is buried or information about an interesting grave that you find. So I plug the same information into that website and it has the picture here and information about Dexter Graves. You can see kind of why I'm interested in Dexter Graves. This is number two on that uh, Graceland Cemetery map. And it's got this fantastic sculpture that um, was sculpted by one of my favorite artists in Chicago, uh, Laredo Taft. Um, it's called Eternal Silence. And uh, it's talked about, I'm showing you here a book called uh, My Favorite Thing is Monsters by Emil Ferris, which is a fantastic uh, graphic novel that came out a couple of years ago uh, based on her experiences growing up in Uptown. And she talks about visiting uh, the cemetery and looking at eternal silence. And she writes that every kid in Uptown knows that if you're brave enough to stare straight into the face of the cloaked guy for a long time without blinking, you'll see a vision of your death. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, I don't believe that, but it's kind of a funny thing to think about when you're visiting there. It is a pretty creepy looking statue. And when I was there recently on a winter day, I could see these prints on the ground. And um, those are the prints of the coyotes that live in Grayson Cemetery. Uh, there are a few of them. And I've seen them many times, including one time when I was visiting uh, this statue and looking at it. I just have, I was looking the other direction. I turned around and I see this coyote, which you can see there over on the left side that was looking at me. Um, I've seen them a number of times. And, you know, coyotes do not generally uh, bother people. And the ones in the cemetery, a few of them have tracking devices on them, and the cemetery just lets them be. And uh, if you see them, don't get too worried. They are not likely to uh, come at you uh, as long as you stay away from them. I bring my uh, telephoto lens sometimes so I can uh, get pictures of them. Here's one that's uh, sitting up on top of, uh, they've got this kind of hill-like area with um, mausoleums in it. And we can zoom in for a close-up of uh, the coyote. Uh, he, look, he or she looks like uh, he's staring at me and uh, probably, uh, I think he got up to leave after this. Uh, this was the one that was uh, stretching and uh, yawning as I saw it get up. Uh, and go for a walk. And here's uh, two of them together. 
So uh, <laughs> I always kind of uh, look for the coyotes uh, when I am there in Graceland and uh, enjoy seeing them. Um, there's an area down in the southwest, southeast corner of the cemetery that's set up as a prairie space where there are some graves in here, but the cemetery is basically let uh, nature run its course here. And I think the coyotes probably hang out in here sometimes, but you can walk around the edges of this and see lots of uh, butterflies and birds. As you continue following the map, uh, if you make a loop uh, kind of uh, going counterclockwise around Grayson Cemetery, you'll get to the grave of uh, Jack Johnson, who was the uh, first black heavyweight champion of the world. Uh, for a long time, his grave, uh, there was a, that big Johnson marker was there, but there was no marker for him himself. Um, that was added several years ago when some uh, admirers of his took up a collection to uh, get him the, the uh, marker that he deserved. As you continue walking north, um, there's this great, this is another uh, sculpture by the same uh, artist who created the Dexter Graves uh, Memorial, the cloaked guy. This is uh, more of a crusader figure. Um, and it's the grave of Victor Lawson, uh, who we saw mentioned earlier at the uh, Lawson House in River North. He was the uh, publisher of the, of the Daily News. So the, um, the inscription on his uh, grave is a sort of uh, a very grand notion of uh, importance of truth above all things truth beareth away the victory. Um, as you continue north, we get towards a nice lake and at near the south end of the lake uh, is the monument of George Pullman, who you may know as um, the person who created the, uh, ran the company that uh, made Pullman uh, cars, on um, railroad cars, luxury uh, cars where people will sit in. Of course, he was very controversial because of the strike of the workers against him in his company town. And so there is this long running legend that his uh, burial place here was uh, designed so that it couldn't be uh, tampered with uh, either that he's um, got railroad ties or heavy concrete around them so that no one would be able to uh, steal him uh, <laughs> or tamper with his grave. Um, the actual details of that are, are sort of in, in dispute. So it's not totally clear exactly what is down there uh, surrounding his coffin. As we continue north, uh, here's the, this uh, nice monument to William Kimball, whose name you might recognize from uh, the uh, product that he's famous for, uh, Kimball Pianos. Um, one time when I was, uh, here's another example of the nature that you can see in Grayson Cemetery when I was Standing here one day, uh, Cooper's Hawk uh, landed on the head of the uh, of the angel sculpture there. Oh, here's a close up of it. Um, I've become kind of a bird watcher in the last year, and, uh, and this is a, Graceland Cemetery is a great place to see birds. So a little bit behind that, um, to the east of that uh, memorial, you find uh, architect uh, Louis Sullivan's grave, which has this great uh, picture of him uh, with his design work. Continuing north, something from ancient Greece, um, Bertha Palmer here in a uh, 1895 uh, painting. This is what that same uh, memorial looks like when you're over on the other side of the uh, lake. I happened to have a nice day here where the water was very still when I took this photo. So uh, you can get a nice reflection. The north end of the lake, and this is called Lake Windermere, is the island where uh, Daniel Burnham is uh, buried. He's the famous architect, of course, who uh, oversaw the 1893 World's Fair and said, uh, make no little plans, and uh, came up with the plan of Chicago in 1909, along with Edward Bennett. And uh, he's buried on this island now, uh, which is where you have a nice view of the lake. And sometimes uh, you'll find turtles here on, on the uh, edge of the water. And when I was at the same spot here uh, recently <clears throat> during the winter, here, here again, we've got some uh, tracks that uh, I, was, <clears throat> I was there first thing in the morning. Uh, no human beings had uh, walked across 
the bridge yet. So it's uh, obvious that these must have been coyotes. I kind of wondered if the coyotes uh, go out onto the island. And sure enough, they do. They even uh, go out onto the water. Um, I think when the ice is a little firmer, they will go out walking across it. Over at the uh, northwest corner of the uh, lake is the Getty Tomb, which is uh, the, this building itself, this, this mausoleum is considered a Chicago landmark uh, designed by Louis Sullivan. Going a bit further south along the other side of the lake, you get to Ernie Banks uh, Memorial, which uh, you can see how people leave things on uh, fans of Ernie Banks, uh, Cubs fans will put baseballs uh, on top of his uh, monument by this by this sculpture of a glove. And there's also a little uh, manger scene, which <laughs> I'm not sure uh, what that has to do exactly with uh, Ernie Banks, but considered a tribute, I guess. Um, one more grave uh, I'll point out uh, before wrapping up my talk here as you wander south back towards the entrance of uh, Graceland Cemetery, you look for the this sort of haunting uh, sculpture that's in a glass box. Uh, Inez, a girl named Inez, either Briggs or Clark. And there was some mystery about um, her exact identity um, because uh, people could not find the um, cemetery records for anyone named Inez. But some researchers have, um, essentially solved that mystery now. And there was confusion because um, her name was Briggs, but her mother had just remarried and had a, and uh, so, you know, Inez's stepfather was named Clark. So you had the two different names and some a typo or a, uh, an error in the grave records that called her Amos instead of Inez. Um, but uh, it's basically been pieced together that this was a girl uh, who died in, uh, let me check my notes here, um, 1880 of um, natural causes. Lots of children died young in, those, in that era, died of diphtheria. Um, and uh, it's a little, it's kind of curious why a sculpture was uh, devoted to this particular girl. I assume it's in glass to protect it from, um, um, erosion of the weather elements. And this this odd picture I'm showing you now is um, some of the stuff people leave on the grave of uh, Inez. Uh, it's sort of goofy. Me, I don't know if it's, is it disrespectful to leave uh, kind of tacky weird items or is it a gesture of love? Uh, I think people really like this sculpture of Inez. Uh, so that basically wraps up my talk here. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, this is not a comprehensive book that has every single spot you would uh, ever want to visit in Chicago. So I encourage people to uh, wander around and not necessarily go to every exact spot on my route, but uh, you know, explore and uh, hopefully you'll have a good time and uh, see some interesting things. Thank you for that. I'm inspired. <laughs> I, I think the the uh, River North uh, uh, expedition in particular, you could you could make a whole day of it. The walk oh, yeah. has so many places where you'd want to stop and look around and peek in. Um, it could just be a fun day. So um, thank you. Very inspiring. Um, we have um, one question in the Q and A. Uh, Larry wants to know what do you think of the Chicago Architecture Foundation walking tours. You know, um, I've had a, I've taken a few of those, and um, the very first time I went to uh, Graceland Cemetery, I took uh, the tours that they give there, and uh, they gave me a really excellent introduction, uh, similar to the talk I gave just now. Um, those tours right now are on hold, but I assume that um, you know, as the pandemic eases. Uh, I would be watching the Chicago Architecture Foundation website for information about when they're available again. And, uh, you know, that's a great way to uh, sort of take the kind of walk that I'm talking about, but you all, you've also got an expert there with you who uh, will tell you um, some of these stories about buildings and, um, and the history of it. So I recommend it, yeah. Uh, Cheryl wants to know, um, are you able to walk into the three churches that you mentioned? Yes. Um, although I'm not sure 
during the pandemic what the situation is. Um, I know that in general, I mean, most churches are like quasi public places where, you know, they, they, they welcome people in. So um, I've gone into St. James uh, to see concerts and um, I have not gone into the Harvest Bible Chapel one. I'm not sure if that's open as often, uh, but the Holy Name Cathedral is certainly, uh, you know, as the as the the main uh, church of the Catholic Archdiocese. Uh, I think you can go in there pretty much any time. Thank you for talking about the Scottish Rite Consistory. That is something that I wondered about for a really long time. When I first moved to Chicago, I was just intrigued by it, and so I spent quite a lot of time calling people and talking to people and trying to find out what it was. And they didn't <laughs> tell me, now I know maybe, why. <laughs> maybe you know more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't, well, if they were a Masonic temple, they're pretty You know, there's, a, uh, there's this quirky little um, antique curio shop in Andersonville called Woolly Mammoth. And I was in there one day and they had this big photo on the wall of, it's like a group photo with like 300 people in it, one of those things where you can't imagine, it's hard to believe how they were able to squeeze all these pictures into one photo and get them all in focus. And it's of the Oriental Consistory. <laughs> so it's like, you know, when they had their annual banquet or whatever, <laughs> well, here's the group photo that they took and it's sitting in, in this, uh, on the wall of the shop in Anderson Hall. I'm like, oh, I recognize that from, the, from that uh, church I've seen down by the Newberry Library. Interesting. Um, as Suzanne wants to know, what, which walks would you recommend for those who are concerned about crowds? And if there's a time or day that would help, that's helpful information as well. Well, um, I think you could, you could draw on any of the walks in your book. Yeah, I mean, I would say, well, I mean, the Grayson Cemetery walk, which I just talked about, um, you will see people in there. Um, and, you know, like a crowded day in the cemetery, you know, you'll run into like a dozen people as you walk around for an hour. So, I mean, it's really not um, a place where you need to worry about too much about social distancing. You know, it's very easy to uh, stay away from crowds. If you want to do kind of a nature walk, um, my book includes a walk, uh, I mentioned Wolf Lake, which is down in the very southeast corner of the city. Um, it's a beautiful place to walk around. Um, and again, you know, you're not gonna run into a lot of people down there. Uh, some of the lakefront walks, I then will go into the lakefront every, you know, pretty much every other day, but it just officially opened. The city's kind of had a weird thing where they officially said the lakefront was closed, but they were not enforcing it at all. So, you know, there would be cops standing at the entrance and all kinds of people like me walking past and the cops don't say anything. They just let you walk in. So I was like, you know, I'm going to keep going to the lakefront. So I have one uh, walk in, in my book. Uh, let me see what it's called. Uh, the lakefront from Addison to Foster, which takes you through um, places like the Jarvis Bird Sanctuary and Montrose Beach. Um, that's, that's a pretty good walk if you want to be distanced from people. If you're looking for uh, more of a, like an a na urban neighborhood to walk around in, um, you know, places like uh, Beverly, which is down in the southwest corner of the city and has uh, beautiful architecture. Uh, you can walk around there. I mean, you might run into a few people on the sidewalk, but it's the kind of place where, <laughs> like me, if you're really concerned, sometimes I will kind of like veer off into the street as I'm walking in. And if it's a side street without a lot of traffic, that's okay. But, you know, you, you don't want to be doing that in the middle of the loop uh, or Wrigleyville or someplace like that where, you might get hit by a bus if you uh, jump out into the street to avoid a pedestrian. So those are a few examples. Thank you. Good ideas. Um, somebody wants to know, how can we see the recording? Great presentation. Thank you. Um, you can see the recording of this um, next week. We'll have it uh, ready to view. It'll be on the library's GPL YouTube channel. Um, and I'm going to be sending everybody who registered for this program a link. Um, to it so you can get to it with just the touch of your mouse. So um, happy to have you watch or share it. And um, somebody else uh, wants to say, tell you that the Chicago Architecture Foundation has started walking tours again on a very limited basis. Oh. So go to architecture.org for information. Very Good to know. Good to know. Let's see if there are any other questions. Anybody else? Anybody? Let's see. Looking for the chat. 
Oop, here comes a question. Oh, where do we get the book? Well, your friendly library has two copies of it. And, um, <laughs> um, you can also obtain it um, from um, the bookstall. There's a um, um, with the, the library can share with you, or you can just call the bookstall, or any other bookseller can, can sell it to you as well. Um, oh, I did want to mention, it's kind of funny when you mentioned the, um, my favorite thing is Monsters book that based on the graphic novel based oh, yeah. uh, around, around um, 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 the uh, cemetery walk. It's been looking at me in the face. It's right outside my <laughs> office. It's been there for a long time. Now I'm going to look at it. It, it's, <laughs> it's really it's fun. Really, it looks really, really fun. It. It's, it's just, it's just <laughs> it's fun to play with. So, um, yeah. You well, can, and you I, 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 live in the, I live in the uptown neighborhood. And she, the author grew up here. And so she has describes and has really nice drawings of some places um, that are, you know they've changed now, but I still recognize certain things like that from you know she's drawing what it was like in the nineteen I think late sixties early seventies in that kind of era, um, but I sort of recognize certain places like oh I've been inside that restaurant, <laughs> so that was really kind of it was kind of weird reading a graphic novel like in your neighborhood. <laughs> uh, and Jill wants to know what's next for you. Oh, uh, well, that? what's next for me? I mean, I'm still doing lots of freelance journalism. I am, uh, there's a, another book that I've been really working on for many years now. It's similar to my first book, a historical true crime book set in Chicago in the early 1900s, but uh, it's turned into this huge project that uh, will probably, I should probably split it up into separate books. So, you know, I can't promise that it will be on bookshelves anytime soon. Um, this is the uh, 150th anniversary of the Great Chicago Fire coming up in, Oct in October. So I'm mm. working on some uh, uh, some stuff about that. I, I can't say too much about exactly where it'll be and what form it'll take, but I, right, I, right at the moment, uh, and I'm looking forward to, I've got a couple of days next week uh, where I can just kind of dive back into my Chicago, Great Chicago Fire research. And uh, I'm reading all these, uh, newspaper articles uh, that were written back in the 1870s about it and um, court cases with, you know, transcripts of testimony about it and things like that. Great. Well, thank you. Keep us posted. Let us know your progress. Um, okay. Thank you so much for, for sharing this wonderful uh, um, virtual adventure. And, um, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Good night. Thanks.